Well, good morning. My name is Will Pinot, and for those who don't know me, I'm the CEO of the Cayman Islands Chamber of Commerce. Welcome to our fifth and final session in our Ready for Business webinar series in partnership with the Cayman Islands government. Today's topic is an employer's HR guide to coexisting with COVID-19. Before we continue, I'd like to remind you of a few housekeeping rules. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded to the Chamber's YouTube channel. Please keep your camera off and your microphone on mute during the presentation. If you have any questions during the presentation, you can place them in the chat feature. You'll have the opportunity to hear our speakers respond to your questions and answers after the presentation. We'll be sending an email to today's attendees that will include a link to rewatch today's presentation, as well as the presentation itself and a survey which we will ask you to complete to help us as we plan future webinars. The Chamber of Commerce represents 600 businesses in the Cayman Islands, and we continue to offer guidance and support, standing both as an advocate for our member firms, as well as a trusted source of information for the business community. This Ready for Business webinar series has been developed to help employers and employees navigate the reopening of our borders and changing government regulations relating to the pandemic. Human resources considerations are one of the most challenging issues facing our members, so it is not surprising that today's webinar has received the most registrations. We postponed the webinar from its original date to ensure the best information was delivered to attendees, so thank you for your patience and understanding. The format of today's webinar session is a 20 to 30 minute presentation, followed by a question and answer session. This is a unique opportunity and I encourage all of you to ask questions through the chat feature and we'll get through as many as those as we can. I am pleased to be joined today by Chief Officer Mr. Wesley Howell from the Ministry of Border Control and Labor and Mrs. Jaffe of Javel Lavelle Linward, the Deputy Director of the Department of Labor and Pensions. Mrs. Linwood holds a bachelor's degree in business administration with a concentration in management and a minor in human resource management from UCCI and has a dip diploma in human resource management and a diploma in employment law, both from Oxford University among other professional certificate certificates. And she began her career with the DPL in 2007 and in October, 2014, hold on a second. She was promoted to the Deputy Director of Labor. Mr. Wesley Howell joined the Cayman Islands Civil Service in 1987 with the Computer Services Department. He's currently the Chief Officer of the Ministry of Border Control and Labor, which includes the Departments of Workforce and Opportunities and Residency Cayman, or Work, Customs and Border Control, Labor, Department of Labor and Pensions, and the Administrative Oversight of the Office of Utilities and Regulatory Compliance, or OFREG. He also serves as supervisor of elections, where he's responsible to delivering the general elections, by-elections, and referendums as and when required. So I now welcome Mr. Howell and Mrs. Linwood to begin their presentation. Hi, good morning, share, all. I'm going to share the screen for the presentation. Go ahead, Wes. Hi, good morning, all. Um, it is my pleasure to be here with you this morning. Um, Ms. Laval, our Deputy Director of um, DLP, will do the bulk of the discussions this morning. Um, happy to answer any questions that um, we can um, answer today. And if there are some difficult ones that you pose, then I will ensure that if we can't answer them live, we'll get back to you as soon as possible um, with an answer there. So. Um, Thank you for all that you do. Ms. Laval, over to you. Good morning, everyone. And thank you, Mr. Pnew, for that introduction. I know that name is a mouthful. So I'll just reiterate. Um, 
My name is Jafia Laval Linwood. I'm known as Laval Linwood because it's a lot easier. Um, so to get started, I just want to say a warm welcome to everyone who's taken the time this morning to join the webinar. Uh, it is certainly my pleasure to be here with you today and to be a part of such an important session for employers, employees, and the general public alike. So to begin, uh, we're going to jump right into the presentation so that we get the best use of time. We are going to focus uh, for the purpose of this presentation on the current labor legislation and how it applies to the current COVID-19 climate, specifically as it relates to queries regarding working from home, utilizing sick days, earning a wage while working from home, taking vacation or sick days, and termination due to an unvaccinated status. So to begin, I think a, a good starting point uh, is to first note that the, the Labor Act does not apply one to the public service, two charitable organizations, and three churches. It's also important to note that with the exception of the two amendments to the act that were enacted in 2020, directly after the all island shelter in place mandate, there has been no amendment to the Labor Act as it relates to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I think it would be remiss for me not to quickly summarize those amendments for you. Uh, the first amendment was applied to section 42 of the Labor Act, which addresses when severance pay is payable and speaks to temporary termination. This section was amended by way of the Labor Extension of Severance Pay Period Regulations 2020. Through this amendment, there was an extension to the 30-day temporary layoff period, which enabled employers to continue to employ uh, their employees for a further period of 30 days, totaling 60 days from the initial temporary layoff as a result of COVID-19. This amendment also ensured that employees continued to accrue benefits pursuant to the Labor Act. The second amendment was applied to Section 84, which addresses the service and sending of documents. This amendment allowed the DLP to serve documents, information, decisions, and other records by electronic means, thereby allowing us to meet our mandate through the service of documents given the restrictions on movement at that time. Okay, so that was a quick recap on those amendments uh, in 2020. Um, again, I reiterate that there have been no further amendments to the Labor Act at this time. Having said that, immediately following the implementation of the shelter in place curfew in March, 2020, the DLP issued a guidance document to assist the general public uh, with questions having regard to the Labor Act and the COVID-19 climate that we quickly found ourselves in. This document was also recently updated to uh, address questions surrounding government mandated quarantine periods and uh, can be located on both the DLP website as well as the explore.gov.ky website. Okay, so moving on to our first slide in the presentation. Uh, we've had a number of frequently asked questions, uh, but we've had a few that um, are posed more often than others. Um, the first question is, if, if an employee can work from home, does the employer have to let them? Okay, so first and foremost, uh, the Labor Act does not address working from home arrangements. Whether it be a request to work from home during a government mandated quarantine period or in general, this would be a matter to be discussed and agreed in house between the employer and the employee, as this is an internal matter uh, relevant to the individual business. Hence, employees are referred to their manager and or human resources and any available company policies to assist in that regard. We do encourage employers and employees alike to continue uh, to monitor the guidelines provided by the government um, on public health measures and to 
and regarding work arrangements and to communicate critical information to the workforce. Okay, moving to slide two. The question is, if employees are unable to work from home, sorry, yes, if they're unable to work from home, should they be paid? This has been a, I would say, the most frequently asked question that we've had um, since the, the quarantine periods and, and all of the updating to the regulations. In this scenario, um, outside of public holiday pay, and any paid leave entitlements, the Labor Act does not require that employees be paid for time not worked. Employers may, however, use their discretion in offering paid during government mandated shelter in place periods or government mandated quarantine periods. Here again, this would require discussion and agreement between the employer and employer in this regard. Okay, on to slide three. Now, this slide is quite loaded, so we're going to break it down a bit for an easier flow for you. The first question is, if employees cannot work from home, can the employee utilize their vacation and sick days? Should they take vacation? Can they be forced to take vacation? This is actually one of those sections where the Labor Act, uh, in my opinion, is quite clear um, and requires no additional clarification. That's my opinion. The, the Act requires that the dates for the taking of earned vacation leave be agreed upon between the employer and the employee. Having said that, the employee may either decline or agree that their earned leave be applied during periods of government mandated quarantine periods. Where there is no such agreement, uh, the employer may again use their discretion to either pay the employee above the requirements of the act or approve unpaid leave given the circumstances. So what happens when an employee runs out of vacation or sick days? In this case, uh, employees, by mutual agreement, the employer uh, may advance vacation leave not yet earned. I'm, sh I'm sure that by now you've noted a pattern uh, with the answers to the questions thus far. There's a lot of communicating and agreement that has to take place between the employer and employee. This is because the Labor Act outlines the minimum standards to be met. The Act does not address internal operational matters that are specific to individual businesses. The, the role of the DLP, and I think this is important, uh, is to ensure compliance with the minimum standards outlined in the Act. Where matters are brought to the attention of the DLP that fall outside the scope of the Act, persons are either referred back to the organization that they're employed with, if it's an internal or operational matter, uh, or where there may be an infraction concerning another law. It is referred to the appropriate authority as may be appropriate in that circumstance. Okay, so moving on, our next slide seeks to answer the question, can a contract be terminated for being unvaccinated? Here again, the Labor Act does not address mandatory vaccination. We are guided by the Immigration Transition Amendment Act 2021 which provides guidance as it relates to the category of persons who are required to be vaccinated in the Cayman Islands. This legislation may be found on the gazettes.gov.ky portal, or you may also obtain further details by visiting the explore.gov.ky site, uh, COVID-19 policies. Employers should be cautious, however, when considering disciplinary action 
since dismissing an employee is not without legal risk. Hence, it is recommended that legal advice be taken in such circumstance. The Labour Act does, however, outline circumstances when a dismissal is for good cause. Further details in this regard may be found in sections 51 through 53 of the Labour Act. And should there be any question, any question arise as to whether an employee has been unfairly dismissed, the employee may seek a resolution of the question by filing a complaint with the, of unfair dismissal with the Director of Labour. Persons may contact the DLP office for further guidance in this regard. And I think at this point, I'll, I'll just mention, um, you can either uh, contact the office uh, utilizing our, our main office line, which is 945-8960 or we're happy to address any questions or concerns that you may have via our general mailbox, uh, which is dlp at gov.ky, or feel free uh, to visit our website for further information as well. Um, before we move on to our next slide, it's also worthy of note, um, if you are aware of any infractions to the Labour Act, and you would like to make um, an anonymous report, please feel free to utilize our confidential tips hotline, which is 945-3073. This line is manned by the director and myself. We are the only two individuals that have access to this line. So we want to ensure that persons are aware that that avenue is available. Okay. Now let's talk a bit about data protection. Um, and again, just to remind you that this, this information um, is not contained in the Labour Act, uh, but it is very important that all businesses comply with the Data Protection Act and are aware of the data protection rules. Uh, so we're gonna refer to the ombudsman in this regard. There's a lot of guidance notes that are available. We've included um, a number of links uh, to, to information that can assist um, in relation to COVID-19, um, employee vaccination status checks, um, the vaccination and COVID status checks for fitness establishments. There's quite a lot of information that, that can be found um, uh, via these links. And if need be, um, please visit their website or contact the office for further information. Okay, moving on. Further guidance here as well. Again, a lot of information, um, a lot of good reading. Um, and I'm sure once you've read through the various um, information that's available that you may have further um, questions at that point. Um, so again, please feel free to contact the appropriate um, authorities. Okay, current COVID-19 regulations reminder. Okay, reporting positive lateral flow tests, where to report, how to report, my apologies, and who should report. What happens if I don't report a positive result? Again, this is not something that's covered in the Labor Act, but this information, there's a, lot, a host of information that is available to us um, on the explore.gov.ky site, and that is updated daily, um, a lot to digest, but I'm sure that any questions that you have, uh, feel free to visit that site. Um, and again, uh, reach out to the appropriate authorities for further guidance in that regard. Okay, just a reminder of prevention and control strategies. Um, we've listed a few here. So promoting vaccination uptake consistent and correct use of masks, physical distancing, hand washing and respiratory etiquette, improved ventilation, routine cleaning with disinfection, remote working, which we spoke about, uh, flexible working arrangements, split shifts or separating teams and staying home when sick and getting tested. So just, just a quick note, um, albeit the, the Labor Act in itself does not address these specific issues, 
um, or, or concerns. We, we do encourage um, employers where at all possible to work with uh, their employees and um, ensuring that we are abiding by the prevention and con control strategies as outlined. Uh, we each have to do our part. It's, it's very important. Um, we encourage each and every one uh, who can be vaccinated to get vaccinated. We all need to do our individual parts to ensure the safety of ourselves, our families, and our island as a whole. Thank you. Okay, so just some information for you concerning lateral flow tests in a screening regime. Uh, the full cost of implementing a screening regime using LFTs, including the purchase of LFT kits, must be borne by the employer, the organization, or individual. So here again, and not to clout the, the, the slide, but there's a lot of information that is available to us, um, again, that can be located on the exploregov.ky site. It's important to note that the testing regime must be carried out in a manner that is compliant with the Data Protection Act 2021 revision. Again, going back to what we said earlier, this is an important point to note when making any decisions, uh, putting protocols in place that affect an individual's personal information and its requirements for the storing and processing of such sensitive personal data relating to the health of the employees. So take some time and review the Data Protection Act and the rules that are surrounding um, the Act and familiarize yourselves as employers with this information and share this information with your employees. It's, it's, it's very important that there's communication uh, between the employee and employer, and we do our best to, to keep our teams informed and um, be available to them for any questions that they may have. All right, so we, we've spoken a lot about the helpful COVID-19 resources that are available to us. Again, just to reiterate that the explore.gov.ky coronavirus blog site is available. Um, there's a lot of information there. I know the, the session this morning is a short session, so feel, please feel free to visit explore.gov.ky for any questions that you may have concerning the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, the regulations that are surrounding quarantine and, the vac and vaccinations. Thank you very much for your presentation. And I guess um, I'm asking, I would encourage everyone, if you have any questions, to, to put them in the chat so that uh, we can we can start answering any of your questions that may not have been covered by the presentation. Um, Wes, is there any, are there any other general issues that you want to kind of uh, address with regard to the rights of an employer um, versus the rights of government. I think you mentioned something from a constitutional standpoint when Absolutely. we were talking. Yeah, so I, I often get questions in relation to matters concerning human rights of employers, um, uh, employees in particular, um, and whether or not some of the policies of the private sector employers are breaching their human rights. Um, the way that our constitution was adopted, um, the constitution is vertical, not horizontal, and that that's a way of saying that the Constitution, as it um, relates to human rights, is um, holding the government accountable for upholding those human rights and any breaches thereof, but it does not apply horizontally. So individuals can't hold another individual or even the business um, accountable for upholding um, human rights on constitutional grounds. There may be grounds that you can do so from a civil perspective. Um, but not from a constitutional perspective. So um, where the government is breaching, that's that's an option, but not not where a business uh, employer might be breaching. And is it does it have a part to play? So for example, if an existing employee has been working with a company for a number of years, they have an employment contract. 
and then suddenly the employer decides to put in place some uh, mandates, but it does, it, you know, their employment contract didn't have those mandates. So what rights does that employee have to say, well, I don't necessarily support what you're saying. And, you know, is the, is that back to, back to uh, Mrs. Lindward's point, which is a negotiation? How does that work? Um, so I, I, I'll let um, Ms. Lynn will take the first stab at that, but I'll also share, um, she mentioned it earlier on in her presentation, um, that there was an amendment to um, the Immigration Transition Act and also the Customs and Border Control Act that brought in um, the requirement for vaccinations for certain persons um, who are um, working and, and living here and that, that requirement kicks in on a brand new application for a work permit or on a renewal um, if persons are on a multi-year work permit so you you're on year one of a three-year work permit and you have annual fees to be paid um, that does not trigger the requirement to be vaccinated but it would trigger if you're applying for a, for a new work permit similarly for persons applying for um, permanent residency for the first time um, that, that requirement is there, as well as um, persons coming in on student visas and some of the other products under the Customs and Border Control Act. So there are plenty of questions coming in on the chat now, so we'll start addressing them one by one. And I, I hope Ms. Linward is still there. I see she's on mute, so... Uh, I certainly right. am. Still there there. you are. Okay, <laughs> perfect. Thank you. So, um, so first question is, what is the appropriate response if an employee refuses to be tested? So, if I may, um, we did, the department did issue um, a guidance document uh, earlier on in the year um, that may be helpful. We we've actually just updated it concerning the COVID-19 vaccine and some general questions that we were receiving. Um, albeit, and, and going back again to what I said earlier, that the Labor Act in itself does not specifically address these specific concerns. We, we did see the need to um, seek guidance ourselves and um, try to provide a general guidance document to the public to see if we could try to, you know, maneuver those questions and assist as best we can. Um, that document can be located also on the explore.gov.ky site. We will be uploading um, the updated version, um, hopefully before the end of the week. So really the only update to that was, was going back to what um, Chief Officer Howell was just mentioning, um, the Immigration Transition Amendment Act. So we needed to take that into consideration um, as we attempted to answer these questions in terms of you know, can an employee refuse to take the COVID-19 vaccine? So the current legislation in place only mandates, um, and I don't want to get too much into an area that's not mine, but um, Mr. Howell is there if, if, if you'd like to jump in. Um, it mandates permit holders and persons seeking to reside in the Cayman Islands to be vaccinated. So you may have those employees who have a legitimate basis for declining the vaccine as well. Um, irrespective of their, their work environment. So here again, we have to revert back to, uh, and I think it's section 52B of the Immigration Transition um, Amendment Act, um, which states that the Medical Office of Health may provide an exemption for persons with exceptional circumstances and so forth. So um, there will be circumstances where, you know, an employee may refuse uh, to have the vaccine. Um, so the other point um, as well is where, where an employer has the contractual right uh, to require an employee to get vaccinated and the employee refuses, um, the employer may be able to take uh, disciplinary action as the employee may be in breach of contract. So it all depends on what is contained and agreed in that employment contract. Now, we, the DLP does not get involved in those contractual issues. Um, section six of the Labor Act outlines um, basically, and again, going back to the, the, the act simply outlines the basic the standard requirement. Um, if an employer wants to go above and beyond, then that's certainly on them. But um, it doesn't provide much assistance to us 
um, to answer those questions. Um, so, mm -hmm. you know, doing our best there. I mean, employers at all times should be cautious uh, when considering any disciplinary action. Um, again, since dismissing an employee is is never without legal risk. There are some other questions relating to to this, and, and again, uh, a lot of legal type of questions. So, uh, I thank you for taking stabs at these things. Uh, do you have a legal right to request vaccination status upon hire? From what I understand from you, it's really for the employer to decide the parameters, or am I wrong? Yeah, I mean, uh, Mr. Howell, I don't know if you want to take this one, but I have to be very careful uh, in, in the sense that, again, the, the main issue here is that the Labor Act has not been amended to address these specific scenarios. So it all goes back again to that communication and agreement between the employer and the employee. Uh, that, that's going to be key. Um, where it, it may prove a bit more difficult is um, when you, well, it may be easier when you're, when you're employing a new employee to put these things in place. But where I've seen uh, the majority of the issue is when someone is currently employed and there's a new policy or amendment to the policies that are in place. Um, again, there's nothing in the Labor Act that says that an employer cannot update their policies. I mean, that's their right to do so. Um, as it relates to the COVID-19 vaccine, again, I would have to revert back to the Immigration Transition Amendment um, Act. So um, there's a lot so, of, yeah, go ahead, Wes. So the specific question about whether or not um, an employer can um, require that employees um, show proof that they're test positive. So the Data Protection Act comes in there at, at, at some levels as well. Um, so the, the, the policy within government is that if you are seeking a benefit, so if you want to take um, COVID um, related leave um, in particular, um, so I, I can share that um, within the government, um, if you test positive, you, you are allowed to take that time as COVID related sick leave, um, but you wouldn't be able to get that benefit unless you share your test results for that. If you just wanted to take um, leave or um, take your regular allotment of, of sick leave for that year, then you could submit just your request without um, your, your test results. Um, so that really comes down to whether or not you're, you're claiming a COVID-related um, uh, leave benefit for disclosing within the public service. Again, so within the private sector setting, um, data protection does apply um, to private sector as it does for public sector. Um, so that would be a matter that the employers would have to, to balance. Um, and there's no clear determination in, in the labor law as to what that is. Um, so we've seen um, employers have that requirement that their employees do report in. So again, a question uh, just generally, I guess this is best practice. What does the government recommend in terms of how often employees who are vaccinated or unvaccinated be tested in the workplace? So our, our recommendation, and, and this is what um, we do in our agencies across the board, um, is twice a week LFT testing, um, okay. a sort of a, um, a scheduling. Employees actually have to sign on to commit to that. Um, and we don't mandate that the, the testing happens, um, but that is our recommendation. And for the most part, most of our employees are, are testing quite regularly. And then um, the, you know, sort of daily testing for those employees who have um, family members who have tested positive, uh, parents or kids in school, those things, um, then if they're vaccinated, that then kicks in and they're allowed to continue to go about their business um, as long as they have that daily negative lateral flow test. Um, I was just in the parliament um, yesterday and one of the requirements to enter the parliament building was that you needed to do a, a, a lateral flow test on the day that you go in. So you could only go in if you had a negative um, lateral flow test. And government provides those lateral flow tests. It's at their expense and not the employee's expense? Yes. Um, some of our agencies test um, more frequently than that. Um, the officers at the prison test daily. Um, 
there's a specific circumstance that the inmates can't leave and go anywhere else. Um, social distancing is difficult. Um, so to protect them, the, the folks that can leave and go back, the, the workers are testing on a daily basis. So do you have a legal right to request vaccination status upon hire? I think yes, we I, kind of answered that. Yeah, yeah I would yeah. say definitely, um, particularly for persons who are not Caymanian, because um, there's a legal requirement that they would satisfy that for work permit processes. Well, that's a good there, point, are, Wes. there are exemptions as well for medical reasons, so uh, which is an important note, yeah. Are there any other reasons that somebody can give why they don't want to be vaccinated? So the, the other one that started done internationally is religious reasons. We don't have that in our legislation, so it's only medical reasons. And again, I, let's see if there's any other questions. A lot of them are relating to the same topic, I think, for the most part. Feel free to put your chat questions in, in there so we can get those answered to you. And just to let everybody know on this call that the Chamber is also uh, be putting out an advisory today for those businesses that are seeking lateral flow tests. The Chamber is trying to contemplating doing a, a bulk order to make it easier for employers to get access to lateral flow tests. So you'll be getting an email sometime today or tomorrow uh, to register if you're interested. I don't see, the, I mean, you guys can look at the chats as well. I don't see any other major questions coming forward that we haven't answered already. And again, uh, well, if I, if I may, just, just a reminder um, that the general guidance document um, concerning the COVID-19 vaccine um, will be uploaded um, hopefully by Friday. So a lot of the questions that um, have been posed are in that document. And um, again, we tried our best to, you know, answer those questions as best we can uh, with the consideration that the Labor Act itself has not been amended. Um, but again, it, it, it should provide some assistance. And as always, we always recommend that before an employer, you know, take any action that they do seek legal advice. And just a just a general question, I guess, you know, if, if somebody refuses to be tested and they're on an employment contract already, um, what 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 can you do? I mean, what can an employer do or is, is there virtually anything or is it just come down to um, what do you do? I don't know. I'm just asking. Yeah. And, and that again, I think that question was, was raised earlier as well. Um, you know, where the employer has the contractual right to do so, which meaning that they have, this is contained in their contract and that has been agreed to, and an individual refuses to, to be vaccinated. Um, and in that scenario, the employer may be able um, to take disciplinary action um, as the employee may be in breach of contract. So uh, again, the advice um, uh, that we've received is it would certainly, um, be more practical for employers to introduce uh, mandatory vac vaccination as part um, of its hiring practice rather than amend the agreements of existing employees. And what happens if there are adverse, there are adverse uh, reaction to a mandated vaccination with somebody who may not have wanted to take the vaccination and there is an adverse reaction which causes severe medical complications. Who's responsible for those medical complication expenses? Is the employer? So the, the employee, each person that takes a vaccine has to sign a consent form. Um, I've, I've heard um, a number of our government ministers um, state that um, the government does provide for some level of care and protection for persons who are um, ill, whether or not you're ill from um, um, COVID um, itself or from results of the, the vaccine. Um, but the, the disclaimer has no, um, would not put the onus on a, on a um, employer for any ill effects of the vaccine. Each, each individual or a parent in the case of a, a person um, under the age of 18, um, would sign that consent form. 
So there the, are a couple of other questions there at the bottom. The, uh, the National Lateral Flow um, Test Policy um, recommends um, twice a week testing, which is an earlier question, um, three days apart. Um, I've seen where some employers um, have offered alternatives of testing more frequently. Um, that used to be testing by a, a PCR testing, which is quite expensive. Um, they've transitioned some employers to um, lateral flow testing. Um, but in some cases, employers are now moving that one step further in that if you're not testing, then you won't be able to come to the workplace. And in that um, light, if you're not able to work remotely um, 100%, then your um, salary would then be impacted by, um, by you not showing up. Um, and that's sort of consistent with what's happening in some of the countries in Europe and other places as well. Here's another question in the chat, just to clarify, since it was mentioned that employers can amend their company policy and requirements for new or future hiring. So if an employer wished to add proof of vaccination as a requirement, um, will this be, uh, I guess, a violation of the labor law, a labor act? Apologies. Uh, there again, um, the Labor Act does not address that specific situation. Uh, we do not get involved in the contractual um, agreements. Uh, we would, however, um, ask that the employer be guided um, by the Immigration Transition Act so that they're aware of the category of persons that are required to be vaccinated when making those adjustments. And, and again, the, the recommendation that's uh, contained in the national um, lateral flow test policy is that employers really ought to have their own internal um, workforce testing and vaccination policy document, um, guidance document for all their employees to um, be aware of um, what their requirements are and that it be applied fairly and consistently across the board. Um, but the, the recommendation would be that where there are specific requirements that aren't covered by contracts, then um, that would be an area where employers and employees could negotiate on um, those contractual terms. And there are some specific um, steps in relation to changing um, employment contracts within the labor law um, in relation to whether or not you're losing some benefits or um, the contract becomes more um, constrained in particular areas. For the most part, Ms. Linwood, are you seeing that the employees and employers are having, you know, reasonable discussions on these topics, or are you seeing a lot of uh, complaints coming before the, the labor tribunals about unfair practices affecting workers? Well, this, this I can certainly say, and this was um, the first thing I did when I, I received an invite um, to, to join today. Um, was to have a look at the, the data and to see exactly um, the, the questions, concerns that have been coming through to the department since last year, actually. Um, so I, I took a deeper look uh, for this year, January to present. And, you know, um, amazingly enough, and I'm happy to report that we have not had, you know, a major influx in questions or concerns or uh, no complaints, actually. Um, a few inquiries um, concerning the uh, COVID-19, the vaccine, uh, quarantine periods. Um, so it's, it's, it's quite low, um, the questions that we're receiving and no, no active complaints. That's good news to hear. There's one question here about data protection and regarding the, the testing results. You know, in a small business of a business that has fewer than five employees, uh, it's hard to keep anything confidential. Um, at the end of the day, how, how do you, what procedures would a small business put in place to ensure that a testing result, it remains confidential? Should it only go to the boss, for example? Somebody has to verify it, right? Yeah, so even in, I, I just posted a link to the um, Ombudsman's guidance on um, data protection. So it, it, particularly in small offices, it, it, it becomes a very challenging situation where um, you are protecting an individual's test results, particularly if they test positive, but also you then need to um, put in um, protection mechanisms for the other staff members. So they need to be alerted that they would have been a primary contact of a no positive person. 
and would, would have to take their own steps um, to protect themselves and their families, um, i.e. moving to a daily testing routine or, 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 or something such. Um, so they would have to comply with the public health guidance in relation to when to isolate, when to quarantine um, based, or when to go to a daily lateral flow test policy based on their interactions with an employer. So the Data Protection Act guidance does allow employee, employers to balance that um, employee right to privacy along with the employer's requirement to provide a safe working environment for their employees. Um, and in some cases that means alerting folks to, yeah, you would have been in a room with someone who was positive yesterday for more than, um, you know, five, 15 minutes, um, less than six feet without a mask on. So, um, you now need to treat yourself as, as a primary contact. So it, Again, with so many of these things, it is a balancing act, but the, the, the um, data protection guidance does speak to it being proportional um, and where there's a, a legal requirement as it would be for the work permit holders and the, the, the first time PR um, holders applying, then definitely the employers have a clear right to ask for that status up front. There is a question It says, may employers offer an incentive to employees who wish to get the COVID-19 vaccine, I, I guess that's that's up to the employer to decide. There's nothing to stop them from doing that, right? Yeah, and, and we've seen um, folks give extra time off. Um, we've seen some financial incentives, some other um, bits. The employers um, are looking at the risk to business. Um, and from that perspective, um, the vaccinations do lower risks, so they are incentivizing um, that, that particular behavior for sure. And then this is probably one from Ms. Linward regarding the employment contract itself. So if somebody has to have reduced hours because of COVID, they've tested positive, can that, can that contract be adjusted to being a part-time employee? So again, this goes back to um, discussion and agreement between the parties. Um, the Labor Act does um, require where there is a change to um, the statement of working conditions, which outlines your, your payment, your hours of work, and you know, all the details surrounding your employment relationship. Once there is an amendment to, to that um, arrangement, that has to be provided to the employee in writing. I think, uh, forgive me, I think it's within 10 days, um, six or 10 days, I'd have to check the law, but there is a, a limitation period there for that to be provided. But there is um, nothing in the act that um, would not permit um, such, such an, um, adjustments. But they, again, going back again to the importance of having those discussions with your, your employees and um, coming to an agreement in terms of the change that is to be made. There's a very sensitive question about the rights of Caymanians in the last question and whether they have a right to deny about having the vaccination. Um, when an employer mandates it. So the question reads, we ask about the immigration amendment, speak about the immigration amendments. Can an employer require Caymanian employees to be vaccinated when implementing a total vaccination mandate? Now, I know we, Wes spoke earlier about the whole idea of the constitutional um, regarding government um, but regard to the employer, that's, I guess that's their decision to, to make, right? So I'll leave that one to you. No, absolutely. Um, so, uh, and we've seen um, locally employers um, making that um, vaccine um, mandate um, be part of their operational requirements for employees. Um, they have in the past, um, offered options in relation to increased testing. So you, ha you have an either or. I am not aware of any employer um, who has gotten to the point where um, they, they, they have a vaccine mandate without um, you know, um, allowances for medical um, reasons for not um, being able to be vaccinated or additional testing. Um, Ms. Limit, I'm not sure if you've you've seen um, cases come through to, to DLP in relation to no, um, no. terminations based on, on, on vaccination status. I haven't. No, nothing, nothing to date, I'm happy to report. 
Okay, it looks like we've run out of questions. So I'll give people about a minute left to put down your last burning question. I know Wes and uh, Ms. Linwood are very busy people, so I don't want to keep them too long. Um, but if anybody has any last minute question, please, please put it forward. And in the meantime, I would just like to ask Wes and Ms. Linwood if you have any closing remarks. Um, so one final question came in there. Um, yes, employers um, can and have um, refused to hire unvaccinated persons, and you know that even applied to some of the government companies and SAGCs as well. Um, not within core government, but but within the SAGCs. So um, yeah, that is that is happening in relation to new hires. So I think from, from the DLP, um, just to reiterate, um, if there are you know, further questions concerning um, a dismissal that uh, may have occurred as a result of um, being unvaccinated or so forth, um, again, the, there is a process uh, in, in the Labor Act where, where there are questions that arise concerning whether an employee has been unfairly dismissed. Um, the employee may seek resolution by filing a complaint of unfair dismissal with the director of labor. Um, so those concerns, questions can certainly be forwarded to the DLP uh, email or, um, you know, walk in, give us a call. Um, an officer would be more than happy to assist in that regard, take them through the steps and uh, do our best to provide as much information and guidance as we can. And I see there is a question there about the what the Labor Act allows for in terms of sick days and when a person who is becomes ill with covid exceeds exceeds the sick days exceeds the vacation days um, they're asking for advice but i think that's probably more of what the employer and employee agree to i think you did agree, say that you could take advanced vacation days as part of this and, and also, um, if the if the, the employees are um, Caymanian or permanent residents, um, they can apply for the expression stipend, um, which covers any days that they're not being paid um, by their employer and are not using their leave to do that. Um, that works. It's it's the prorated amount that's being paid to the displaced tourism workers, so that works out to sixty nine dollars a day. Um, so in most cases, it's a it's a fraction of um, what an employee would normally earn um, on on their um, on their um, daily pay amount. Um, but that is available, and there's some criteria there that 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 are there. But links to that are also available on the um, gov.ky coronavirus website. So um, employers who have employees that find themselves in that position um, can can um, point, and it doesn't even have to be somebody positive, right? So um, we, we've seen a, an unfortunate case where a parent with kids in different schools and different classes have had successive kids test positive um, and they ended up having to be isolated for, you know, 32, 34 days, um, not being vaccinated. The, the parents weren't able to take advantage of the lateral flow testing, um, daily testing mechanism. So they ended up um, exhausting their leave um, and then ended up in a no pay situation. So um, that is a scenario. The support line is also available. That's more for non-perishable um, um, supplies for persons in quarantine and um, isolation. There is an assessment criteria that happens with that as well um, to sort of determine need, but that's also available for individuals who find themselves um, in, in isolation, quarantine, can't leave, and then you know um, can't get access to um, what I call hurricane-type food food items, canned foods, and those sorts of things, non-perishable items. Okay, I think we've run out of questions, and so I just like to see if both of you had some final comments to make. Um, I'd just like to thank you for both for taking time out to join us for this webinar, and hopefully the participants found it useful.
Any Thank closing you. remarks? <laughs> no, I, I, I hope that we were able to bring some clarity to some of the matters. Um, I know some of the answers were a bit gray. That's because they're not clearly defined in legislation and we haven't had test cases come through um, the courts in relation to how those are. So um, some employees and employers find themselves on the cutting edge of, of what's happening with those labor relations. Um, but I, I'm happy that I was able to come on today and, and share a bit about um, what the, the policies are, um, what the guidance documents um, say, and what practices are being done by, by some agencies that, that, that we are aware of. Um, and if there's anybody that requires additional links that aren't provided in the PowerPoint, um, happy to do those via um, the chamber as well. Thanks, Wes. Are you good, Ms. Linwood? Yeah, I, I think I've said quite often, <laughs> but um, certainly thanks again for, for having us on. And, um, you know, I just again to reiterate that the DLP, you know, is here to answer any questions that we can concerning the Labor Act. And uh, feel free to reach out. I mean, that's 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 our job. That's why we're here to provide guidance as best we can. Okay. Thanks again for both to both of you. And just to remind people again that this webinar will be uploaded to our YouTube channel and also shared with government to distribute through their different channels as well. So again, thanks both Mr. Howell and Ms. Mrs. Linward for your time. And I wish everybody a good afternoon and look at those links for further information on this topic. Thanks, Mitchell.